afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such a turnout on a rainy early November afternoon. I'm Scott Mainwaring, and I'm the director of the Kellogg Institute. And on behalf of the Kellogg Institute and the Nanovic Institute, we are delighted to welcome everyone this afternoon. And also just want to express my gratitude to Jim McAdams, director of the Nanovic Institute, for this great collaboration. Today we have a panel of people who know a lot about the crisis in the Eurozone. And it's uh, you know an incredibly interesting and important event in the world today. I can't tell you the last time I opened the New York Times and didn't read a single major article about what's going on in the Eurozone. It's, it's this event, the crisis, or not an event, but this happening, the crisis in the Eurozone, and the Arab Spring are probably the two most important international events that have dominated the news this year. And this crisis of the Eurozone has a, a history now of several years, and it will go on for many years into the, into the next, in, into this decade, I'm sure. Um, the implications for what's going on with the Euro are huge for the United States, for Europe, and, you know, although it, this doesn't filter down to us um, so much here, the implications in human terms for citizens in Europe and around the world are huge. I happen, you know, you might hear something about the Argentine uh, case today, not that Argentina's suddenly moved to Europe, but um, I, in, in, in the 1990s, Argentina pegged its currency to the dollar, and there were some similarities between that experience. Uh, in 1990, Argentina had a poverty rate of 16%. In 2002, 45%. I don't know if there's been a similar case in world history without a civil war of, of a similar increase in poverty, and we're seeing some of this in Spain and Greece today. So I'm delighted to briefly introduce the panelists. Um, the events in Europe today have implications across multiple disciplines in scholarly terms, and some of them are represented on the panel. Jeff Bergstrand, we're actually, the panelists are speaking in alphabetical order. Um, Jeff Bergstrand is a professor of, of finance at the business school. He's talking about the Eurozone crisis in the context of the status of the world economy. To his immediate left is Robert Fishman, who's a professor of sociology. Robert is speaking on why a definitive solution to the Euro crisis is unlikely. Um, to his left is Alexandra Geisinger of political science. She's speaking on why there will always be a Eurozone crisis. And I think we're going in increasing pessimism here <laughs> in this case. Um, and Sebastian Rosado wins that championship with this title, Why the Eurozone is in Trouble and There's Worse to Come. Um, I've asked each of them to speak seven to ten minutes to give us time for discussion at the end. And um, I do have one announcement. Melanie Webb, where are you, Melanie? Right there. Melanie said that if you're um, a first-year student, you can uh, give you her name. And I don't know if you're going to get a lollipop or extra credit. Or anyhow, some, some wonderful outcome will happen if you give Melanie your name. But that's only true for first-year students. Jeff and, and all the panelists, welcome. Okay, uh, good afternoon. And um, just so you don't have your own crisis, note that the clock at the back, when you turn your head around to view it, is uh, still on the old time. So it's, uh, it's not as bad as you think. Um, all right. Um, I am uh, I'm a macroeconomist. I teach uh, in the business school. So I'm going to give uh, a lot of views that uh, obviously uh, focus on the economic aspects of this. Um, now, that just said, um, I think the Eurozone is a centaur. And uh, the centaur is something from Greek mythology. 
Uh, it is a Greek mythical figure that actually, whether or not some of you probably already know what it means, but for those of you that don't recall from your Greek mythology, um, that is a figure that's the half man, half horse figure, which uh, we see routinely uh, throughout uh, culture, uh, even on TV commercials. Um, but uh, I draw that analogy uh, because, well, for one thing, we're, we're in a Greek crisis in this Eurozone crisis. <laughs> and uh, I feel very much that, you know, one point to leave, at least in terms of my comments here today, is to think of the Eurozone uh, as a centaur from Greek mythology. Um, and uh, to kind of back that up, but much more recently, uh, so this is from The Economist magazine. Uh, not surprising that I may be quoting from The Economist magazine. Um, this is from the one that actually just came out this weekend. Um, talking, about, uh, talking about it, they note, the Eurozone is a hybrid, a single currency with 17 national fiscal and economic policies. It has no common treasury, no tax raising powers, no joint bonds, and no central bank acting as a lender of last resort. In good times, which was much of the last uh, decade, remember it started in 1999, uh, this did not matter. But in the worst financial crisis in decades, the flaws are glaring. The central thesis, what I want to talk about today, uh, just briefly, the Eurozone, it, it refers to 17 countries that now share a common currency, and that's the Euro. And this means that it's a common central bank, the European Central Bank, established in 1999. Uh, this is only a subset of the 27 member uh, European Union. The European Union is uh, more of a common market. So not all of the countries in the European Union, which is the vast bulk of Western and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, are in the Eurozone. The formal construct of this Eurozone is the technical name is actually, you know, everybody just calls it the Eurozone, it's the Economic and Monetary Union. That's actually the formal name. <coughs> And one thing to keep in mind there, that there's no word such as fiscal uh, in that. And that's what the, uh, the quote from The Economist was referring to. Now, when the, uh, when the European Union, uh, when the Eurozone started in 1999, countries had to qualify for it, and there were, was something called the European Stability Act. And the European Stability Act was the requirement that to become a member of the Eurozone, which is simply a higher level of economic integration beyond just a common market for trade uh, in goods and services and factors, uh, four critical criteria, four legs. And the first was that no country could have an inflation rate more than 1.5% above the three lowest inflation countries. Okay, So all the countries had to satisfy that. The, no country could have a nominal long-term interest rate more than 2% above the average of the three lowest inflation economies. So these were monetary criteria. These have largely been satisfied up until the recent crisis, and Greece, with now long-term interest rates at 25%, are clearly violating that. Um, but here's where the, the problem has, uh, uh, has been for uh, the entire period of the Eurozone. Annual government budget deficits cannot exceed 3% of GDP. Currently, the average in the Eurozone is 4%, and there are very few countries satisfying that. And the uh, debt-to-GDP ratio must not exceed 60%, for which many do. Uh, Italy and Greece, well over 100%. So the big problem is that it's, uh, I'm going to talk about, it's not been a, uh, uh, there have been monetary, I'm sorry, fiscal guidelines, but it's not truly a fiscal union, something like the United States. And the United States has a very large, important federal government. We have a federal government, state and local governments. Both of those have a very broad and deep debt markets, especially the federal treasury market, treasury securities, U.S. bonds, which is one of the biggest markets in the world. Europe, the Eurozone, simply does not have that. Um, so in the, I've got about five minutes uh, left, so I want to make four points in my remaining time. Um, and these four points, to kind of keep them straight, is there are going to be four points about monetary and fiscal policies in both the United States and in the Eurozone, to kind of keep track of things. Um, one thing I emphasize when I teach uh, macroeconomics in the business school um, is, uh, is the notion of short versus long run, okay? And the same policies uh, can be good and bad depending on the time frame. 
for example, uh, in the United States, uh, central bank policy is determined by the Federal Reserve System. And the Federal Reserve System in the United States by, uh, has actually a dual ma mandate. Uh, one of those mandates is to keep the inflation rate, the rate of change of prices, very low and stable. And actually, for the last 25 years, since 1985, over the course of three Federal Reserve presidents, we have kept that in the United States, a very low and stable inflation. Uh, but it also has a second mandate, and that's the one where our Federal Reserve has acted very, uh, very expeditiously in the last three years since the financial crisis, and that's actually to address uh, the lack of full employment, the high unemployment, the recession issue, by cutting interest rates from 5% levels in 2008 all the way to basically zero, officially 25 basis points, but effectively zero. And they've committed to that uh, until for at least two more years, till 2013. So while the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, um, and it can actually accomplish this, uh, you might think, well, if the Federal Reserve is expansionary, that can address unemployment, but that may cause inflation. Or if the Fed tends to be contractionary, um, that can hold down the inflation rate in the, in the economy, but would tend to cause more unemployment. But it actually has two tools when you understand this notion of short versus long run. Because in the long run, after 25 years, by creating a credible uh, monetary policy in terms of low and stable growth of the money supply, they have been able to basically anchor inflation expectations so that now in the short run for the last couple of years, they can quickly move and reduce interest rates to try to spur economic activity, although they're facing this uh, zero bound right now. By contrast, in the Eurozone, they have one mandate, and that is low and stable inflation. So the Central Bank of Europe has always been very slow in terms of lowering interest rates. They still have an interest rate uh, above ours during these uh, very difficult times, and even now uh, the crisis being centered in the world economy in Western Europe. The, the last two points I want to make is about fiscal policy. You know, U.S. fiscal policy uh, also is a dual mandate. You know, we read about, we experienced this summer of trying to uh, rein in the federal debt. We're very concerned about this. Uh, in the long run, we know as economists, a lot of research shows that uh, countries with persistent and large budget deficits in the long run, on average, have lower productivity performance, lower rates of growth of standard of living. They simply don't perform as well. So it is part of the, the needs of the government to get us national debt in order in the long run. And we even accomplished this 10 years ago with budget surpluses. Um, but in the short run, it also has a mandate to uh, uh, get rid of high unemployment, to try to ensure full employment. And right now, in the, the pol current political environment, we're falling short of that. But we do have, and we have a history of using that policy to, uh, um, to, uh, to stimulate the economy in the short run. By contrast, and this is where the, uh, and we have this uh, very large, deep, treasury market in order to uh, issue debt in the short run to try to get economies out of, uh, of, uh, uh, out of recessions. And clearly the fiscal policies of 2008 and 2009 and monetary policies did help to prevent, and macroeconometric models show, did help to prevent a second Great Depression. So the final point is fiscal policy in the United States. We have that, that latitude because of a, a large debt market and a, a substantive federal fiscal policy. Um, in the Eurozone, they simply don't have it. They have guidelines. And uh, to just kind of close up, because I'm running out of time, um, let me uh, uh, close with uh, one, one more quote, which uh, brings, uh, brings to the point uh, the failures uh, in the Eurozone along this line. A rescue uh, must do four things. First, it must make clear which of Europe's governments are deemed illiquid and which are insolvent, giving unlimited backing to the solvent governments, but restructuring debt of those that can never repay it. Second, it has to shore up Europe's banks to ensure they can withstand a sovereign default. Third, it needs to shift the Eurozone's macroeconomic policy from its obsession with budget cutting towards an agenda for growth. And then finally, start a process of designing a new system. And that entails basically uh, a more um, federal-like, supranational uh, fiscal union. So uh, with that, I'll kind of close my remarks and uh, take questions later after the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? 
Thank, thank, thanks very much, Scott. Thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, thanks to all for being here. It's great to share the uh, program with uh, colleagues who have so much to say on uh, this problem and its antecedents. Um, it's great to see all the interest here, but I'm sorry it's about bad things and worrisome things instead of good things. Europe has often been the site of hope and good things, and it's also often in history been the site of bad and troubling things. We're again at a moment when Europe is the site of bad and troubling things. Um, in my analysis, there are many reasons why the euro crisis is unlikely to be resolved in a definitive manner. Many reasons why the solutions which have been cobbled together by European leaders in recent meetings are unlikely to really resolve the underlying problem. And I should add many reasons why a definitive collapse of the euro is possible. Um, I certainly hope it won't happen. I'm not predicting that it will happen. It will be very costly for Europeans and others if it does happen. I can't begin to put a probability on that. It's possible that one temporary solution, one standby solution after another will be cobbled together, but I don't believe that any of them will be definitive. And I'm going to quickly suggest a number of reasons why I have that rather pessimistic view of the current crisis being faced by Europe. The first point is really the most obvious one. I won't spend long on it, but it does need to be mentioned. The economic conditions of the 17 countries which together form the Eurozone are very, very different. Um, it's not easy for Americans to understand the magnitude of the difference. Just one um, bit of data very quickly, which is illustrative of this point. Unemployment in Austria is 3.9%. Unemployment in Spain is 22.6%. Now, you might say there are differences in the United States in the unemployment rate from one state to another. It's true there are. They're not as big as the differences between Austria and Spain. But if you look at the regional level in Europe, the differences are even bigger. For in many regions in Spain, and indeed in some other countries in Europe as well, the unemployment rate is far higher than 22.6%. So the range of economic uh, conditions is far greater in Europe than in the United States. And nonetheless, there's only one monetary policy to deal with all of those countries. A monetary policy which is appropriate for one country in Europe is not going to be appropriate for other countries in Europe. That's a big problem. It's not easy to resolve. It was spotted in advance by economists of very different theoretical and political persuasions, and they were right to identify this problem. Now, there's a second issue, a second problem, which is more has been more um, often observed and theorized by political scientists and sociologists, even anthropologists, than uh, economists. And that's the issue of European identity. Um, Europeans identify primarily as residents and citizens of particular countries, also as citizens and residents of regions. Many of them identify to one degree or another as citizens of the European Union, but that identity is a much weaker one for most of them than their national identity. With the creation of the common currency in 1999-2002, um, it became, came into existence as the theoretical underpinning of European economies which participated in 1999, the new bills, the new currency began to circulate in 2002, which is an issue that I, uh, I examined together with others in the book, The Year of the Euro, uh, uh, based on a conference which took place here just nine years ago. And at that time, um, sociologists, political scientists, and many Europeans were hoping that the new currency would contribute to the building, the construction, the flourishing of a new European identity. That didn't happen. Um, I could go on about that, uh, but it continues to be the case that for most Europeans, uh, the EU is not an important identity. That matters. It matters a great deal in this uh, crisis, and it matters because the lack of a shared identity means that both citizens and political elites approach the crisis policies intended to deal with it, and possible solutions more from the standpoint of their national identity and interests than from the standpoint of shared European identity and interests. And that is an enormous stumbling block to one solution that's often mentioned as a possibility, and that is the creation of a shared European treasury. That would be difficult. It would be very difficult for it to function effectively because of the point I just made. But there are many other points that I'd like to make quickly. Um, I can't go into any of them in great detail. 
Um, a very significant point has to do with the institutional infrastructure of economic performance and economic success. Um, we know that the institutional infrastructure of the economy has a huge role in determining what the impact of economic policies will be on economic performance. I want to provide just a few examples of some of the dimensions and arenas in which the institutional infrastructure of economic performance varies enormously among the 17 countries which participate in the euro. First of all, there's the question of uh, the salience of peak level nationalist associations of business people or entrepreneurs and workers or unions. In some countries, there are strong national associations which group together virtually all entrepreneurs, employers, and workers, and which can negotiate um, agreements intended to limit wage increases and create uh, the basis for the growth of employment. Other countries lack such institutions. Secondly, uh, vocational education. Some European countries have absolutely superb vocational education which can make possible the flourishing of top-end industrial production. Uh, Germany is the quintessential case of this, and there are other such cases in Europe. But many European countries are more like the United States, and they lack a vocational educational system uh, which is comparable to the German. That makes a huge difference in the way economic policies actually impact the performance of the economy. A third point, the financial system. Some European countries, a fair number of them, have uh, publicly owned banks which promote uh, investments in industry. Um, other countries lack such banks. That makes a huge difference in the extent to which monetary policies contribute to or do not contribute to job growth. Now there's one uh, institutional point which is much emphasized by elites in the European Union and the European Central Bank and the IMF, that's labor market institutions. But they, I would argue, and I don't have time to go into this, are actually much less significant for economic performance and employment growth than is often thought. Um, European countries are being pushed to adopt similar labor market institutions, but nothing is being done to encourage them, or very little is being done to encourage them to develop similar institutions in the other arenas which I mentioned. The, third, the, the next point which I want to mention, which is perhaps the most important one, has to do with an issue raised by Jeff Bergstrom in his very uh, interesting and important remarks uh, it, 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 on this panel, and that has to do with the European Central Bank. Um, the European Central Bank, by statute and by treaty, is prevented from monetizing sovereign debt. It's prevented from being a lender of last resort. Um, in most circumstances, it's a bad idea for central banks to monetize debt, to be a lender of last resort to uh, countries. Um, and it's best in most cases for sovereign debt to be sold on the open market. But we're not living in ordinary times. The uh, Federal Reserve is buying vast amounts of American uh, of, of bonds issued by the United States. The European Central Bank is prevented from doing this in an equivalent fashion uh, by statute and by treaty, and that's an enormous problem. And without exaggerating, it is quite possible that that will uh, provide the basis for the collapse of the euro. It's an enormous problem. The ECB, and especially the Germans, are very reluctant to change the statutory and treaty basis for the operations of the ECB. They're making an enormous error with um, huge possible consequences as a result. Um, the next point that I want to make, and I don't have much additional time, I'm aware, has to do with the policy advice emanating from EU institutions and the ECB. The policy advice which they are offering focuses above all on austerity. That's good advice for some countries and very bad advice for other countries. And I want to mention quickly the case of Spain. Spain has an accumulated public debt which is lower than that of Germany, lower than that of France, and they were running a budget surplus before the beginning of the financial crisis in 2008. But they had a huge property and construction bubble. It burst beginning in 2007, 2008, creating the 22.6% unemployment I mentioned earlier. Spain is being inappropriately and unwisely pushed to adopt policies of fiscal austerity. This is not only painful for the Spaniards, it's systemically dangerous. 
Why is it systemically dangerous? Because the Spanish banks have huge portfolios of loans, which they may never be able to collect if unemployment continues to increase in their country. So Spain may have a huge um, bill to be paid in the future for rescuing its own banks if nothing is done to stem the rise of unemployment in Spain and reverse its course. But that rise in unemployment is being engendered precisely by the policies being pushed on the Spaniards by EU institutions, by many EU leaders, especially the Germans, and by the ECB. So what is being presented as the solution to the problem is indeed part of the problem. Now finally, I want to suggest quickly that the two enormous problems on the horizon, indeed one of them is not on the horizon, it's at center stage right now, the two enormous problems are Spain and Italy. If either of those two countries requires a rescue, um, the cost of the rescue would be greater than the EU uh, can easily pay. And the result easily could be, sadly, a collapse of the euro. I'm not predicting that. Hopefully, a solution will be stitched together. And even more hopefully, I pray that the ECB will change its policy and accept the need, at least in the short run, to monetize debt, to purchase sovereign debt. But if there's no significant change in the policy of the ECB and the policies which currently prevail at the European level, the danger is very real that we will not only see a continuation of the price crisis, but instead it's deepening and possibly a total collapse of the euro. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. So I know many of you came today to talk about the crisis that's going on today. Um, I'd like to step back a little bit, um, actually back to 1717, and talk about why I titled my presentation, While There'll Always Be a Crisis in Europe. One of the things that's interesting, if you go back 300 years, is that you can see that there has been, um, for a century or decade after decade, a push towards fixed exchange rates in this region. They weren't always called fixed exchange rates. It wasn't always understood what a fixed exchange rate was. Um, but we can see, starting in 1717, why 1717? It's when Sir Isaac Newton inadvertently pulls uh, Britain off by medalism to the gold standard. Uh, he does so by accident, but after that period, we see countries in Europe slowly move towards uh, the British gold standard. And this is the first time where we can really see how integrated these uh, European markets are. And one of the, the characteristics of uh, Europe as a bunch of small states that uh, are best suited to benefiting through trade and through transactions cross national and also as a set of states with very permeable uh, borders in which it's very hard for uh, governments to actually control these uh, cross-national transactions um, is as true today as it was um, back in the period. And so you can see, looking through uh, history, one that I've stolen from um, Eichengreen, if you want to go and read it in uh, full, uh, we see time and time again an attempt by the countries to create some version of fixed exchange rates. Uh, first to the gold standard, and then through other mechanisms in Bretton Woods, then during the snake, and then now finally culminating in the European Union. Uh, sorry, not the European Union, uh, the Euro. Um, and what's interesting is that these have fluctuated in some being formal and some being informal, um, but there have been, even during periods of informal uh, agreements, very large flows of money from one bank to uh, another bank. Uh, the, uh, the Bank of England in particular has benefited from France and Russia bailing it out um, uh, multiple times during the 19th century. And even as late as 1907, we see the German bank bailing out the Bank of England. And so there has been a lot of cooperation. There's also been a, a uh, sort of a long-term attempt at moving towards an integrated monetary system. Again, it wasn't always formal. Today, we have much more formal uh, monetary system with different rules that uh, countries are going to have to play and, um, and negotiate in different ways. But it seems to me that um, even if the euro falls apart tomorrow, uh, you can wait a few, you know, a few years and there will be another attempt. The last 300 years has told us that there will be inevitably a move, again, because of the characteristics of the countries involved. They're very, they are very different, but they're very close. These differences mean that there's benefits of trade. And so it seems to me almost inevitable that we will get another monetary union, or another monetary system, integrated monetary system, and another crisis that will come uh, a um, you know, some period later. 
course, you came to here to talk today about the Eurozone crisis. Um, but I think to talk about the Eurozone crisis, we do have to talk about this pull towards fixed exchange rates and what it is that uh, countries think that they're gaining from these fixed exchange rates. Uh, one of the things that uh, my research uh, tells, us is there, tells us is that there are some benefits to fixed exchange rates, and there's some definite um, costs. One of the major costs that people recognize is that countries with a fixed exchange rate um, are are far more likely to observe a financial crisis. So that is what we're seeing right now. We know it to be true. If you have a fixed exchange rate, you increase your chance of financial crisis. So again, then why move towards a fixed exchange rate? Um, we can think about three benefits of a fixed exchange rate. And again, for many of you that not uh, don't deal a lot with this. Why do I keep saying a fixed exchange rate instead of uh, the euro? You can think of the monetary union of the eurozone as just a very formalized set of fixed exchange rates for a large set of countries. So they're actually all fixing within each other. So I'm saying fixed exchange rate. You're thinking euro. It's um, with some complications, basically the same thing. So again, we can think of the benefits of a fixed exchange rate, but they come only if you're credible. And this has been one of the difficulties for a lot of countries, especially a lot of small countries, is how do you credibly commit to this fixed exchange rate? And what's fascinating, if you look at the data that's been collected by the IMF over the last 30 years, about half the time a country says that they're fixing, um, they're actually floating. And about half the time they say they're floating, they're actually fixing. So it's very hard to know when a country is being credible. So how are you going to uh, tell, a country, tell investors, tell your domestic uh, population, tell anyone that you care um, that you are actually credibly committed to a fixed exchange rate? Well, one way is to merge into a monetary union like the EU. And why would you do that? Well, once you have the ability to have a credible exchange rate, a fixed exchange regime, um, you can see basically three uh, benefits. One is um, that that uh, countries that have a credible uh, fixed exchange rate regime um, tend to see lower inflation. And this is going to be particularly true when you are fixing to what used to be the German Bundesbank and is now the ECB, which is known for having a mandate that is particularly focused on inflation and nothing else. And so that has been um, one benefit is much lower inflation. Uh, second of all, um, especially for small states, which we know benefit more from trade and are also much more vulnerable to currency risk, having a fixed exchange rate um, will enhance trade, particularly with your major trading partners. And for most EMU countries, it's still the case, and will probably continue to be the case, that the other European um, Union countries, and the, particularly the other EMU countries, are your main trading partners. So um, for Italy, it's Germany and France. For Spain, France, Germany, and Portugal. And even for Germany, their major trading partner is France. So again, you want to take take advantage of the benefits that a fixed exchange rate will get you with those major trading relations. And then third, and this is the one that's a bit um, complicated today, usually having a credible fixed exchange rate will get you lower borrowing costs. Now, this can tend to be seen as a great thing. We'd all like lowering bar lower borrowing costs. Um, I know I would on my credit card, but um, this may have been what got Greece into the trouble. So I'm going to say technically this is a benefit. This may not have worked out so well, but it, for a short period of time, Greece was able to take advantage of much lower borrowing costs, and it would have been nice if those lower borrowing costs and that bar money that they borrowed could have been turned into um, some greater growth. Um, so those benefits help uh, not only explain you know, what led people into the euro um, and also sort of what um, has um, has uh, kept people so interested in trying to retain the euro. But I think it also helps explain sort of this puzzle, which is why did so many countries join the euro when economists, as Robert uh, pointed out, have known for a long time that the nations uh, that have come into the EMU were never uh, really fully what um, should be expected of what's called an optimal currency er uh, area. An optimal currency area is somewhat what we have in the US. Uh, the Economists who write on what they call OCA suggest that an optimal currency area or an optimal currency union um, needs to have uh, four characteristics. One, it needs to have a high degree of openness, it needs to have a symmetry of economic shocks in the different states involved. Uh, three, it needs to have high labor mobility. And the four, it needs to have a system of risk sharing. 
Now, even at its start, the EMU really only had one out of those four things. And problematically, as the uh, Eurozone has expanded, um, as it's broadened and it's deepened, it's actually become less of an optimal currency union than it mm. was um, at the beginning. And this is not something that I, you know, people have noticed today. This is something that you can find in textbooks. It's clear. You can put match the U.S. Um, and uh, the euro up, and you can explain why the euro does not fit into this. And so, again, why this myopia? And I will argue that it's these short-term benefits of low inflation, lower um, borrowing costs, um, and then, of course, the benefits of trade that sort of allowed people to ignore some of the um, deeper concerns that really the, the institution that was set up was not really correctly allied with the characteristics of the states. And then, again, as probably um, Sebastian talk, there's obviously a political reason, too, why some states were allowed in when really that just took uh, the Euro Eurozone farther away from what would have been an optimal currency union. The third point I want to make is also somewhat in line with what Robert was saying, which is a, sort of a fascinating story that I don't think is pulled out enough right now, which is that the IMF has turned, uh, changed its tune, and nobody is listening to this. So usually when I teach about the IMF, I have to teach about the so-called Washington Consensus, which is what many of the IMF critics say uh, the IMF was requiring of developing countries. They were requiring developing countries in a financial crisis to cut government spending, um, and to really do these types of fiscal austerity programs. What's fascinating in the last year, looking at all the documents coming out of the IMF, is they're saying spend money. The government should spend money. Uh, if you look at the last World um, Economic Report in um, October 20, uh, or actually it was last year's, uh, it says, um, I, I quote, the idea that fiscal austerity triggers faster growth in the short term finds little support in the data. Fiscal retrenchment typically has contractionary short-term effects on economic activity with lower output and higher unemployment. So the IMF has turned its tune. It's saying, you know, we should actually see government spending at times of uh, financial crisis, and nobody is listening. And as Robert pointed out, this is, might be very painful uh, for many of the um, citizens of these countries. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Kellogg Institute and Nanovic Institute for inviting me. Um, I've actually spoken on this subject to the Nanovic Institute um, about a year ago, well, maybe eight months. And my advice then was uh, the Board of Trustees was here, and I said, listen, short the euro. Uh, you'll make a lot of money. And nobody listened to me, and the euro is down 10% since then. Um, so again, short the euro. <laughs> I promise and use the money to buy my book. Um, okay. <laughs> Which is in paperback or on Kindle. Um, okay. Uh, basic argument I'm going to make here. Uh, all of Europe's problems uh, stem from the fact that Europe is not a single state. Right? There's no United States of Europe. Uh, there is no chance that Europe is going to become a single state. Um, and this means that even if Europe rides out this crisis, there are going to be many more crises in the future. And eventually, there's going to be a crisis big enough that it will collapse uh, the euro. So that's the argument I'm going to make. And let's take each of those points uh, one at a time. Uh, start with Europe is not a single state and why that's a problem. Uh, Europe is a bunch of separate states. Uh, with a single currency and a single monetary policy. And this raises a series of problems. Uh, first problem, if you have a one-size-fits-all monetary policy, it's going to be too tight for some states. It's going to be too loose for other states. Um, if you're Greece, what you want to do today is you want to do, Scott mentioned Argentina, you want to do an Argentina. You want to devalue your currency. Uh, you want to export a lot. You want tourists to come in, both of which will happen uh, if you devalue your currency. But you can't do it because you're in the euro. Um, so that's the first problem. Second problem, some states want to run big deficits, and some states want to run smaller deficits. But again, they will have to run the same deficits. Uh, this was a huge problem in 2008, 2009. Sarkozy and Merkel uh, went head to head about it. Um, and Sarkozy, we now know, actually threatened to pull France out of the euro. Right, Napoleon IV got uppity and said, you know, uh, and he patched it together with Angela and, you know, they're back on it. But the point is, um, 
it was a huge problem in 2008, 2009. Uh, so that's the second problem, deficits. Third problem, uh, when states run into trouble, when member states run into trouble, you've actually got two problems. The first problem is that the state that runs into trouble um, cannot manipulate its currency or its monetary policy uh, to get out of trouble. Uh, the Irish have to make very painful changes at home uh, to solve their problems. Greece is being asked to make very painful changes. Uh, Spain, as Robert said, is being asked to make painful changes. Italy has agreed to make painful changes. Uh, and if the Italians say they're going to make painful changes, you know they're not going to make them. Um, so that's one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger is that somebody has to bail these states out. And that somebody is usually Germany. Germany's constantly on the hook for other people's bad behavior, right? Uh, they got to deal with the lying Greeks, right? The Greeks lied to get into the euro, by the way. Uh, we now know this. My former employer helped them to do it. Um, <laughs> Goldman Sachs issued Greek government bonds and covered up uh, the truth about the debt. But anyway, you got to bail out the lying Greeks. you got to bail out the lazy Italians. By the way, the reason I keep going against the Italians, you know, my father's Italian. I can say these things. Um, you gotta, you got to bail out the Italians, and, you know, God knows who's next. Right? Probably the Spaniards. Um, so you got states that want to get out because they're being asked to pay such costs to stay in, and then you got states that want to kick them out because it's too costly to keep them in. The basic point here is that there are all sorts of problems when you have a single currency and you have separate states. Um, and the solution uh, and most economists agree on this. Well, most economists I trust. I don't trust any economists anymore. But most economists that I trust will tell you that the solution is a single European state. It is the only way you're going to get out of this problem. Uh, Paul Krugman said this in the New York Times. To make the euro work, Europe needs to move to political union so that the European nations start to function like American states. Uh, Paul de Grau, who is the um, uh, advisor to Barroso, uh, said this, without a political union, the euro cannot last. Um, and the reason they said this is the arguments I just laid out for you. Um, the crazy thing is we knew all this before the euro went into effect, as, as Robert told you. Uh, it just shows you how crazy people are, right? Um, I, I've learned studying political science that d the default policy position is stupidity. Um, and this is clearly what happened in the late 1990s. Um, Okay, so it's not a single state, and that's a problem. Second point, there is no chance Europe is going to become a single state. Europe's track record with political union is awful. Uh, let's go back, 1950s. 1950s, the Europeans uh, agreed on something called the European Defense Community. It was never ratified by the French, but they agreed on something called the European Defense Community. And part of the European Defense Community was an agreement that they were going to create a European political community. Um, it probably got voted down by the French, who had probably been voted down by others um, in any event. 1970s, again, the Europeans revived talk of a European political community. It never went anywhere. In fact, the member states uh, retained control over their own policies uh, and refused to create a European political community. Then you got the Constitution, the famous Constitution. Uh, the Constitution was voted down in 2005, um, but even then, uh, it wasn't really an attempt at political union. The European Constitution has, or had, <laughs> it's not there anymore, but uh, the European Constitution had a beautiful preamble written by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. And all you need to know about uh, Giscard is that he actually wrote a novel uh, once about a French politician who was having an affair with a British princess. Uh, he was talking about himself and Lady Diana. Uh, it's a fictional novel, and he's the guy uh, who wrote uh, the uh, preamble. Um, it was a complete disaster. That was the only part. Of it. The, the only part of it that suggested political union was the preamble. The rest of it uh, was just a set of basic fixes. What followed from the Constitution was the Lisbon Treaty, uh, and everybody got very excited because it said, "Finally, we have political union. We have a president uh, of the European uh, Council." Uh, I defy any of you to name that person. It's Herman Van Rompuy. Uh, I defy any of you to pick him out of a lineup. Um, this guy is not very effective, right? You know who Sarkozy and Merkel are because the states are still in charge in Europe. Um, so why all these failures? Um, all these failures are because the Europeans love sovereignty 
they're nation states, and nation states don't like being told what to do. And they don't want to sign on to any agreement where some European super state is going to tell them what they have to do. Um, by the way, I think there's even less chance of political union today than there was back in the past. In the past, you had a good reason for political union. It was called the Soviet Union, and it was on your front. It was on the European doorstep. Uh, today, there's no Cold War, and there's no need for a political union. So there's even less chance today than there was um, in the past. So there's no chance you're going to get one. Um, this means, if you don't have a single state, that the crises are going to keep on coming. Right. Um, the Europeans got through the crisis with Ireland. Uh, they got through the Sarkozy Merkel tete a tete in 2008, 2009. Um, they may get through the Greek crisis. They may not. I don't know. Um, it doesn't matter because there are more crises to come. If they get through it, um, Spain might be next. Italy might be next. Um, again, for all the reasons I laid up, laid out early on. Um, and this is my final point. Eventually, there's going to be a crisis that's big enough to bring this whole thing down. Um, you know, Greece is a very small problem. It's a tiny economy. And the fact that they're having so much trouble sorting this problem out does not bode well uh, for when big crises come. Uh, Italy and Spain are huge. Uh, if they go down the toilet bowl, uh, no one's going to save them. Um, they might decide to go their own way rather than deal with the austerity measures. Uh, you've been told already that Spanish in, uh, unemployment is um, out of control. Uh, the Italians could do anything. Um, or the Germans may decide that they've had enough, right? Y you've all heard that there's too big to fail. Uh, I think Italy and Spain are too big to save, um, and that could be the end of the euro. Thank you. Well, thank all of you. Um, what I'd like to do is open the conversation to the audience. And I think we'll take about three questions at a time. I'd like to maybe reserve the first round of questions for students. I often see that if we be begin with faculty, that the students are you know, shy to pitch in. And if we do it the opposite way, this, the idea of a shy faculty member doesn't exist. So. <laughs> Um, please identify yourself and uh, tell us if you're addressing your comment or question to one person in particular. I'd like to begin with you, please. Yeah, hi, my name is John Robert. I'm a sophomore in Mendoza. Uh, this question is for Professor Bergstrand. Um, the price of gold has uh, hit like, really high recently. Um, how do you see the, the um, European debt crisis affecting the price of gold uh, in the future? Thank you. Yes. Um, this question comes in. I don't know if this is going to be particular, but the last speaker mentioned that it's likely the euro is going to fail. What would the situation look like at that point? Or if countries decide just to withdraw, how would they do that? Would they go back to their original currency? What sort of obligations would they have to carry out? Great. Thank you. Uh, third question, comment? Yes, thank you. Just to the group, what is the optimal outcome here? I mean, what is what should happen, and what should the situation look like in five to ten years? Great. Why don't we begin with Jeff, and um, we will. I'll ask you to be brief. These are very expansive. They're ec great questions on which we could we could go on at length, but. Um, and if you don't want to address particular, if, if if you don't want to address any of the three, just pass the mic. Um, yeah, uh, I'll actually just uh, I'll briefly address all, all three uh, questions, and then uh, perhaps my colleagues want to uh, say something. I mean, price of gold, uh, that's actually fairly short. Um, gold has historically, uh, throughout uh, centuries, uh, been a safe haven. And so certainly in times of crises, uh, gold's price go up. Uh, we saw that with the US uh, debt situation uh, and the crises earlier. Um, in uh, the last couple of years. Um, so we moved to it as a safe haven to protect assets because people simply believe it's a safe haven. And that widespread belief makes it uh, uh, an alternative to the euro or even the dollar. Um, on the, uh, I'll mention something on, on uh, the withdrawal issue, talking about the euro failure, the second question. 
I think it's just really interesting to note that um, they are playing with a possibility is uh, countries cannot be kicked out. The problem with the Eurozone is that uh, they're penalized. Uh, originally, when they were not meeting these deficit requirements and debt to GDP ratios that I mentioned before, they were supposed to be penalized. There's just been very little even hand slapping um, over the years uh, for countries that violated it, and that's part of the problem here. Um, so what you'd really have, say, in the case of Greece, is Greece would have to choose to leave. And that means they'd have to create a, a new currency, and they'd probably go back to their old one, which is a drachma. The problem is that that would uh, lead to such financial chaos and speculation in Greece that whatever value of the drachma occurs, that there would be an enormous inflation that would cause a huge reduction in standards of living. So that even if the, the Greek people were to accept an enormous increase in taxes right now, it would probably be a far smaller price to pay than what they would pay in terms of loss of standard of living, like the Argentinian crisis uh, referred to before. Um, let me leave the last one. I'll, I'll leave that up to any of my colleagues. Robert? Uh, thanks very much. Let me uh, just offer a few words, first of all, on the consequences of uh, the end of the euro, if that happens, or the consequences of one country leaving. And secondly, I will offer a few words on uh, what might be a kind of a, a best possible uh, solution to the problems that we face. Um, uh, it, uh, the problem with any country, any one country leaving the euro is that for that country, it would be very traumatic in financial terms. Um, it would also be quite difficult for banks and financial institutions in other countries, and it would quite likely lead to a kind of a stampede phenomenon uh, which would uh, could create a run on banks in countries which had not decided to leave the euro. So if one country, what's called Greece, decides to leave, the co consequences in within its borders and beyond them are likely to be quite large. Um, many economists believe that the uh, fallout from the collapse of the euro would be absolutely devastating, even worse, in fact, than the consequences of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, George Soros has suggested that if the euro collapses, it will be it will lead to the onset of a second Great Depression. In other words, something much worse than what we have experienced over the last few years. Um, I'm not an economist, and I can't um, offer a sort of a serious opinion on whether that um, concern is somewhat overstated or um, or, or is well placed. Um, but clearly, it would be quite dramatic if the euro did collapse. That's why we have to be worried about it. Um, uh, I agree with um, uh, all of my colleagues in, in really all that they've said, and uh, certainly Alexandra's right that there always have been and will be pressures leading towards something more or less like the euro, but Sebastian's also I, I, I quite agree with Sebastian that the possibility of um, arranging a definitive solution in this strange supranational agglomeration of independent states it looks quite dicey, but I do see a possible solution which, although not perfect, I think is better than any of the alternatives, and I think it's much more plausible than a United States of Europe. And that is simply a redefinition of the role and the capacities of the European Central Bank. If the European Central Bank were willing to serve as a lender of last resort, if, we're, if it were willing to purchase the bonds now of Italy, um, which uh, suffered a terrible deterioration in the market value of its bonds just today, if the European Central Bank were willing to do that, the magnitude of the crisis would be vastly diminished. There would be some consequences. It would lead to some increase in the inflation rate within the Eurozone, but it's been low and it's not been a problem. Um, the Germans don't much like um, that scenario, but they they have been some of the greatest beneficiaries of the euro. It's been absolutely excellent for them. Their economy has done fabulously well under the euro, and I would be delighted if they would um, support that kind of a um, of, of an outcome. I really don't see any other outcome which I consider to be both plausible and sufficient to deal with the crisis faced by euro. A significant rewriting of the treaty and the statutes of the European Central Bank is, to my mind, the only way out. It's not the perfect solution, but it would work, and it's at least barely plausible. Thank you. Alexandra? So um, I, 
Good I'll follow up. Uh, Robert's thinking about um, what could be done. I mean, in the perfect functionalist world, uh, we would get a central government with the ability to you know, move the fiscal spend in, you know, in areas that need to uh, have greater growth. Um, that's not going to happen, as Sebastian pointed out. I think a middle step following on what Robert said is that the ECB's mandate needs to be expanded, um, much like um, was discussed before. You know, right now, it's just the single mandate is for low inflation. Uh, adding the uh, importance of un you know, keeping unemployment low, I think, would help. A second thing that would help that we haven't had the time to talk about today is expanding uh, regulation over the banking uh, industry. Uh, we kind of allowed Ireland to not take some of the blame, but the first, one of the first steps into this crisis was Ireland because of uh, poor regulation of its banking industry. And that caused a lot of the lack of liquidity that caused problems for Spain, that burst the bubble that was probably going to burst anyway, but burst more dramatically and has left Spain in a worse position. Again, as Robert pointed out, Spain actually didn't look so bad, but is being pulled down. It's a lot like some of the Asian countries that were taken down by the uh, Thailand uh, currency crisis when the bot fell. You know, Malaysia and Indonesia you know, had some is issues, but, but particularly Malaysia wasn't doing so badly until there was a liquidity crisis, and that pulled it down. So if we um, were, if Europe in particular, but also more broadly, were able to do better in terms of international banking regulation, at, I think that would help, and I do think that might be one area in which there could be some uh, political agreement. Um, second uh, question I just want to briefly uh, mention is looking at what would happen if Greece pulled out. And I think here, as Scott said earlier, Argentina might actually be a really good an analogy here. Argentina's defaulted a number of times. Usually it's been on external debt, and that's been problematic for them in terms of getting financing and getting external debt. Um, more recently, they've defaulted on their own people, and that's had much more significant uh, consequences in terms of wealth. And uh, in uh, Greece's case, they have a lot of external debt, but a lot of their debt is also within the country, and so would cause a huge loss to the middle class and, and much more poverty, I think. And so there's also that to take in. It's not that they're just defaulting on the rest of the world. They're actually defaulting on their own people. And again, it's that short term versus long term. They're going to pay one way. Do they pay through taxes, or do they pay through losing their pensions? Thank you. Sebastian? Uh, to the question of what would a collapse look like, um, I have no idea. I just know it's going to collapse. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, Greece defaults, pulls out of the euro, and starts reprinting drachmas, right? Um, I mean, I'm sensitive to this argument that uh, Greece would pay costs because, you know, it would, uh, it would now have a terrible reputation. But somebody want to tell me that Greece has a great reputation today, right? Pulls out of the euro, it's like... Holy shit, we thought that Greece was a, you know, a, a good economy that was going gangbusters. I mean, no one's going to say that, right? So it's not clear to me that there are that great costs for Greece uh, to pull out. Um, I actually think, though, that um, there's too much focus on these small countries like Greece, or let's just say that the badly performing countries, Greece, Italy, Spain. Um, you know, I think Germany is the key here, right? They're constantly being asked to bail people out. You have 80% of Germans who want to return to the Deutschmark. 80%, right? They're sick and tired of having to bail these people out. Um, so uh, so you could see them pulling out of the euro. Um, now, the question is, you know, would that be very costly? Um, well, they all have their own central banks. Uh, they all have retained the capacity to print money. Uh, it's pretty clear that it would be less costly to reprint their own money than it was to switch to the euro uh, in the first place. Um, there would be all sorts of ideas mooted out there. One is by John Gillingham, a historian, who says that you could keep the euro, but you could have the national currencies floating alongside it. Um, so there's all sorts of solutions um, that I think are possible. I, I don't think... It's crazy to th uh, or it's incredibly costly um, for them to go their separate ways. Uh, on the issue of an optimal outcome, what should the situation look like? I um, haven't really thought about it, but um, I, again, I can't really think that it's that bad. I mean, as Alexandra pointed out, um, Europe has always had some kind of fixed exchange rate system. I completely agree with her. Um, and there have just been different kinds of fixed exchange rate systems. And, you know, you move from a single currency to a fixed exchange rate system where revaluation is occasionally possible. Um, I, don't think, um, I don't think that would be a, too bad. Yes, thanks. 
uh, Con Ryan, junior finance major. Um, assuming that a collapse of the euro is inevitable, as Professor Rosado says, what are the implications for the United States? I think that's mm -hmm. part of why we're all here today is what are those consequences for us? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Kavinsky. I'm a senior political science major. Uh, when hearing about the EU, you really seldom hear about democracy, although a lot of the institutions are directly elected. And like what Professor Rosado said, uh, how 80% of the ones are in favor of the return to the Deutsche Mark. What, what is the likelihood of a democratic or of a transition from the Europe to democratic means rather than like economic necessity? Why don't we flip the order here, and uh, maybe we'll begin with you, uh, Sebastian. Um, Just address maybe yeah. t two of the three. I have a bunch of Italian cousins. I'll tell you what that lifestyle is like. <laughs> <laughs> they stay in college till they're 35 years old. Uh, they don't get a job. Uh, they have medical care and dental care better than you have in this country, and it doesn't cost them anything. Right. It's a huge welfare state. Um, they work about five hours a week. Um, I mean, I'm deadly serious. Right? I and mean, this, is, this is the problem in Europe, that you're asking for austerity measures right, from countries that don't look like the United States. I mean, they don't have austerity in their lexicon. Um, and uh, you know, the Spaniards, they might even be worse than the Italians. Um, so uh, um, yeah, well, anyway, that's their lifestyle. Um, I'll leave the other questions to the other panelists. <laughs> so I'm not touching that one. Um, I'm going to move to the other two questions, um, which uh, I think actually the one that is, I find interesting is what's going to be the effect on the U.S. dollar. One of the things that... Uh, you, I think it was the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, sorry. Um, uh, let me uh, talk about what's on the U.S. dollar, because I think one of the things that's been fascinating are financial crisis. I recognize that internally we see that we're suffering from a financial crisis, but it could have been much worse. And why was it not so bad? It was because we're still the international uh, reserve currency. What does that mean? We're still the, the US dollar is still the currency that everything is traded on. So if two foreign countries are trading, they tend to do it in US dollars. Uh, if it, we're still the uh, place where people want to buy uh, US uh, treasury bonds. We're still the place that when people feel at risk, they send their money to the US. So in the midst of the US financial crisis, crisis, people were sending their money to the U.S. Um, because this is still a safer haven. And the U.S. Uh, predominance as an international reserve currency has supposedly over the last 20 years been under threat. And so there's always this question of when will American hegemony end? And one of the ways that we have hegemony is through being the international reserve currency. And the, uh, it's, sorry, I should have also mentioned, it's the currency that people store, other countries store in their banks, in their central banks, when they want to have a savings, and so it's tended to be the dollar. And over the uh, since World War II, it's the U.S. dollar has lost some of its dominance to primarily the euro, and then. <laughs> Um, uh, to other currencies. Obviously, China is still threatening. China sometimes comes out and mentions that it would like to take the U.S. place in this, but the country, or the area that's been most successful in competing with the U.S. has been the euro. Um, and this um, recent crisis has given the U.S., maybe 10 more years, I don't know, Jeff, I have a better sense of 10 more years of dominance, 20 more years of dominance, and that's helpful because it allows us to, again, suffer these crises with a sort of lessened blow because people will continue to uh, invest in the U.S. in a way that maybe our economy doesn't deserve. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first on the question of the implications or consequences for the United States of a collapse of the euro, none of us know definitively or with certainty, but the conventional wisdom among economists is that the consequences of a collapse of the euro would be devastating on the world, uh, throughout the world. Um, if that's right, and I have, as I say, no disciplinary expertise in the field of economics, um, surely it is the case that the consequences would be worse in Europe than in the United States. During the Great Depression, there were huge differences from one country to another in the magnitude of the destruction of economic um, uh, well-being and livelihood. The Great Depression was far worse in the United States and in Germany than in France. And if we do have an economic 
calamity caused by the collapse of the euro, it's quite likely, I think, that it will be less severe in the United States than in other countries. Obviously, I hope that if the euro does collapse, I hope that that conventional wisdom is wrong, uh, but I fear that it may not be wrong. Um, it, as as, as for the possibility that Europeans will decide to leave the euro via referendum, that's really an interesting issue, and I think it points to uh, an enormous paradox. The country in Europe for which the euro has been most positive is Germany. It's the one in which the euro is least, uh, pos is least popular. In Greece, where the euro has been a disaster, most uh, people wish to remain in the euro. So it's very hard to predict how people would vote if there were a referendum. But there's a lot of sentiment among uh, political elites to keep people from voting. Um, the Greeks were recently offered the possibility of voting in a referendum to see if they agreed with the uh, terms of the rescue package which had been negotiated by political elites. But as soon as the Prime Minister Papandreou offered uh, his people the possibility of voting in a referendum, other European elites got very worried and they said they could have none of that. And so the referendum was nicely canceled. Um, welfare states and cultures do vary in Europe, among European countries, and between Europe and the United States. The most successful European countries in economic terms, the ones with the largest and most successful stock markets with the greatest history of innovative com companies of competing internationally, are the countries with the strongest welfare states. Um, if you're looking for a part of the world where there's evidence that a strong welfare state much stronger than in Greece, Italy, or Spain, is compatible with successful and vibrant capitalism. You can find it in Europe. But the countries that manifest that pattern are not in the euro. I'm thinking of Sweden and Denmark. Um, they have uh, high taxes, um, very successful private companies, stock markets, innovation, and large welfare states. They elected not to join the euro. It seems they were wise to do that. Um, as for cultures, they do differ a great deal, but not always in the ways that we would anticipate. Many Germans believe that people in Southern Europe work less than they do, but all the data shows exactly the reverse. And um, indeed, there's a lot of data to suggest that people in Southern Europe, at least in some Southern European countries, work uh, very, very hard. But there are enormous cultural differences in Europe, from one country to another, even within countries and between Europe and the United States. And that is part of the background, really, for the difficulty of building a uh, common currency in this set of countries, which are so very different, uh, the one from the other, as really everyone has emphasized. Thank you. OK, um, just a, a, a few thoughts. One is uh, actually just to what Robert said kind of sparked something, which is there's, there's actually an economic growth in the research in that uh, <laughs> throughout the macroeconomics profession is kind of the closer a country is to the equator, the less productive it is, everything else constant. I mean, institutions matter for growth, openness to trade and globalization matters for growth, but also locale matters. And uh, and that's just a well-established uh, empirical fact. You know, one thing to mention about Argentina, we, uh, we talked about Argentina and uh, it went on to the, uh, the fixed exchange rate, actually helped it a lot uh, a while uh, back in the, uh, the eight, uh, 1980s and into the 90s. And then the uh, Argent uh, Argentina went off uh, the dollar and um, went into a flexible rate once it arrested inflation. But actually, currently, uh, you may be familiar about there's been firing of people in government in Argentina because they've been reporting inflation rates that are uh, that the government doesn't like to see. And it's very much the case that Ar Argentina now, not on, in a common currency or a currency union with the United States, is actually moving back into hyperinflation. So there certainly have been benefits benefits of keeping inflation unstable for countries that have been in these things. And I think that's clearly been the case over the years for Greece, Italy, and, and several of the others. Um, I, I'll disagree a little bit with Sebastian. I, I think Italy is too big to fail. Um, and I actually think in the end, I think the euro will continue. Um, so I, I don't see it um, 
uh, it ending any time uh, in, in the near future. I think that uh, one step in his favor, and, and I grant you that uh, I agree that I think it's very difficult, uh, given what's happened with uh, constitutional votes across the countries for the European Constitution, uh, but we're not going to get the fiscal union that I argued for earlier, and I think that others are, uh, here are sympathetic with. But that said, I think there will be minor steps, a lot of band-aids. Uh, one of them is the decision to have, and was announced a couple of weeks ago, uh, to increase the European Financial Stability Fund, the F SF Fund, and that was uh, uh, enlarged by a trillion dollars. Um, so uh, there, there are methods there to try to develop uh, facilities to uh, to try to save these economies. Um, so I think that's uh, very important. So um, um, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it uh, leave it at that. Okay. Great. Um, we'll take at least one and maybe two more rounds of questions if, if, if others want to join the conversation. Yes, please. Matt. Thank you all for, for your, your presentations and your comments. Argentina has come up twice um, for the last hour and a half. And earlier this semester, there was a large event on the lessons that could be learned from Latin American transitions to democracies that could, that could be learned by the transitions we're uh, witnessing in the Arab Spring. And I'm wondering if there are other countries or other experiences in Latin America that any of the panelists would point to recognizing the differences that there is no Eurozone, there is no monetary union, but even if their experiences in styles of federalism within Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, or other economic steps taken to avert past crises. Thank you. This question is for Sebastian, and I'm just wondering, um, you, you mentioned that uh, you're, you noticed that the Europeans were pretty stupid in, in knowing that there would be all these barriers um, to monetary union. Um, but isn't Alexander right in some sense that they aren't, they weren't stupid, there were lots of reasons to try. Of course, there are all these barriers that you guys have mentioned, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if we're less likely to face a sort of simple, straightforward uh, collapse and more uh, a perpetual political tragedy whereby uh, there's incentives to, to wear away those barriers, but uh, maybe not enough political capital to do so. Great, thank you. And yes, please. Uh, yes, the way uh, we were all describing the Eurozone um, kind of reminded me of when the United States uh, was in the Article of Confederation and how the economy kind of didn't work out, how to draw the comparisons between the Eurozone right now and the Article of Confederation. Great, very interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll ha I'm happy to take a fourth question this round. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Luca, first year at the uh, what's your recommendation to countries that are uh, about to enter the European Union here in a couple of years? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to begin, Sebastian? Yeah, my advice to those states is don't do it. <laughs> You're in for a world of pain. Um, on the Articles of Confederation, actually, an interesting question. Um, uh, the United States of America did not have the greenback until after the Civil War. Right? Before that, um, the states had different currencies. And you could argue the United States of America was not a state. Right? In fact, it was known as the United States of America, plural, right? Civil War is a war between states. Um, and um, I think the reason they couldn't get it together was because they were not a single state. And then the North, part of the South. And now you have a state, a single state, United States of America, singular and you can have a single currency. Um, I don't know what the lessons are for Europe uh, that Germany take over. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, it's actually an instructive case. And it's a perfect example, actually, of where, um, you know, um, you, you need political union to sustain um, the currency union. Um, uh, this point about the Europeans knew the problems. Yeah, the Europeans knew the problems, and they explicitly said it's not about economics. Right, they're transported by visions of, you know, Europe being the land of peace, love, and dope, and they'd overcome like that past, and you know, Europe's the European dream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and they explicitly did it for ideational uh, sort of uh, reasons. Um, 
And again, I'm sure there are many benefits to, um, to currency unions or turning to a single currency. Um, they knew what those benefits were, but they thought the costs were greater, but they thought the ideological sort of uh, intangibles uh, were, uh, uh, were more important. But again, I mean, you know, think about when this happened, right? The Cold War ended, the Soviet Union is dead, democracy is in victory, right? It's the end of history. Um, and uh, they were caught up in that. Jeff? Um, yeah, I'd like to address the, the question over here on, our, you know, we were talking about Argentina, what other countries in Latin America? Um, I think actually one that stands out is, uh, is Brazil. So Brazil has been having basically a, a flexible exchange rate. Uh, Argentina and Brazil are really interesting cases because um, they both experienced hyperinflation, Argentina, in, in the 1980s, and then they went on the dollar standard. In other words, they basically imported Alan Greenspan uh, as their central bank head. Um, and then uh, they were able to, granted there was a huge depreciation of its currency, loss of standard living, but also made them very competitive. So that uh, they had low inflation and did very well from about 1980 till, uh, uh, we'll say in the last 20 years. Uh, Brazil also had hyperinflation and then finally had a, uh, uh, took a, it, it was kind of had a roughly a fixed exchange rate and then finally took a huge depreciation that its currency float, huge devaluation about 1994. But they had a series of stringent economic reforms uh, in the 1990s and that, that were kept in, in the last decade. I mean, you know about Lula, uh, the president, former president who retired after, after several years, maybe about a year ago. And uh, despite you know, having very little education coming from unions, he pursued very centrist policies that were very healthy policies and fiscal di discipline, and very importantly, central bank independence. Uh, Brazil, of course, has been helped by China. And actually, the, the solution to all this is that China and India and even Africa are growing. Uh, as we face this malaise in Western Europe as well as the United States, uh, Africa and Latin America are benefiting enormously from China and India's growth. And the fact is that uh, I don't think actually a dollar thirty-seven for uh, a euro is that much different than uh, several months ago is a dollar forty-five. I don't think the euro has changed that much against the dollar, but both of those currencies are depreciating uh, against the uh, the Chinese yuan, which is appreciating, and it should, because that is a source of hope. That's a source of economic growth uh, to help our economy, since they're not going to be pursuing uh, fiscal expansion under this political environment. The question on joining the, the European Union is a very interesting one, and it raises the interesting point that there are, of course, a number of European Union members uh, which do not belong to the euro, which are not part of the common currency. Some of them include some of the most successful states in the European Union, um, Sweden, Denmark, and of course also the United Kingdom, um, and some of them are recent um, members of the European Union which do not have the um, financial and economic conditions which have been required to join the euro. Um, it's not entirely clear to me that the European Union will fail if the euro fails. That's really a very, very big question. Um, and many observers believe that if the euro fails, the EU itself is doomed. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain of that. Um, and I do believe, although I'm a critic of the way the euro is working, that European Union membership has been good for most of the countries which belong to it. Um, that's something on which we could talk a great deal of time, and there's certainly room for a lot of debate on that. But um, in most countries that have joined, um, there is massive support for belonging to the European Union. It's somewhat less controversial than the common currency uh, itself. So uh, on on the, I I have I sort of have an interesting point, which is one country that was not has not been allowed in um, for a long time and was very controversial about whether it will be allowed in has been Turkey. And if you pull down the IMF report for growth in Europe, the country that's done best in the last year I think I'm, this, I'm a year off, but in the country in the in the 2010 report, it's Turkey, right? So um, my little phrase is Turkey has the last laugh here um, because you know it was con there was a lot of concern that bringing Turkey in would further destabilize uh, Europe um, or in the EMU. There are other issues as well. Um, 
I think in terms of the countries coming in, um, you know, they do, again, have a lot of benefits. There are reasons why people move to fixed exchange rates. Uh, and uh, Jeff has brought that up. I think rolling this into the question about Latin America, you know, we can look at Ecuador as an example of a country that dollarized and then undollarized and dollarized and undollarized. But one of the things that dollarization did was give it some stability. What it didn't really take into account was how different its economy was from the US. And um, it's been interesting in the, 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 you know, the Federal Reserve Bank has been very clear. And I think Greenspan was very clear during the period of uh, many countries in Latin America discussing dollarization, if not actually doing it. There was a lot of discussion about it. And Greenspan came out and made it sort of a statement about uh, that the Federal Reserve Bank would not consider economic growth in these countries, these countries that were choosing to dollarize. Um, you know, I think that countries entering the uh, Eurozone should think that the ECB is not really going to consider their economies. They're small, they're peripheral, um, and you know, those states need to weigh the benefits of having a stable exchange rate with the clear lack of benefits when you have a, a central bank that's not that concerned with growth in your economy. And that means considering fiscal spending, considering where, what you borrow money for, and so a lot of other things. So my hope is that they will come in with their eyes open and understand what the, the, the costs and benefits are. Um, that might be a little bit naive on my part. Well, um, before Jeff Bergstrand agreed to join us, he said that he has a plane to catch. He has to leave for a plane at 6. And I told him, well, I'm sure this will be really interesting, but I hope that for the sake of time that we finish around 5.45. It is now, we inverted two digits. It's now about 5.54. Um, you know, this is such a hugely important issue in today's world and, as, as someone's question alluded to, for the United States, that we could go on at much greater length, but we're not going to. Please join me in giving a hand to the panelists. Thank you all for coming today.